Hello, this is Shambhavi. Welcome to Satsang. Satsang is an ancient spiritual practice from India. It means being in reality together. I give Satsang live every Wednesday and Sunday night in Portland, Maine. This Dharma talk was recorded during one of our Wednesday night gatherings. Please visit jayakula.org to learn more about the teachings. You can find video satsangs on Jayakula's YouTube channel, and my books are all available on Amazon.com. Much love to you, wherever and however you are. We live in an extremely psychologized culture. Our view of ourselves, and therefore our experience of ourselves, because we embody the view that we hold most dear. When we have a view of something, we feel something tastes terrible. That's our view of it, and indeed it will taste terrible. We feel a certain situation is dangerous, and indeed it will feel dangerous, because that's our view of it. So all of these views that we have and hold dear and think are natural or normal or right or true, those views organize our body, energy, and mind. A person who feels good about themselves will walk in a certain way. A person who feels sad will walk in another way. Right? Everything that we feel, and particularly our views about things, our concepts, our dearly held beliefs, and the ingrained ways that we've been trained to relate to life, through concepts, we embody those. This is what embodying view means. It means that our literal bodies, our literal energy, our literal minds, and our literal emotions are being shaped by those views. So starting in the late 19th century, we began to hear, and it began to filter out this psychological story about the human being. First of all, that view was born in a time when, in the West, of course, this has nothing to do with anything in India or China or Tibet or Japan. This is just how the West, this comes from Western Europe, this view, that children were born uh, as kind of what it was called a tabula rasa, meaning like a blank slate, and that they were full of drives and impulses that were unorganized by any real personality. So they were just, children were viewed as sort of, in this psychologized way, as sort of blobs of impulses. And then the story of you, the story of your personality, of your body, your energy, and your mind, of your emotions, and how you relate to everything, started at the moment of birth. So you were there with some sort of family situation or at least caretaker situation and your entire personality and everything you felt was thought to begin there and be a result of your relationships primarily with whoever gave birth to you and took care of you when you were younger and maybe some other traumas along the way and things like that. Most of you, even though you've had many, many teachings, still embody this view to a large degree. The symptoms of this are that you still relate to spiritual practice as something that's going to psychologically repair you. That's the number one symptom that you still hold this view of who you are and how you got this way. That you were born you got damaged, and spiritual practice is going to reverse that damage. (laughs) When A lot of times when I ask you how your practice is going, or sometimes I might ask, what do you feel you've gotten out of your practice? Immediately the first word will be, I feel more, less, 
<laughs> something. <laughs> and it will be something about these psychological problems, which you may, you may call them karmas at this moment, but you're really not talking about it any differently than anybody in our psychologized culture. You this are still, and this is sort of the second big giveaway, you are still deeply, deeply upset that you have been, as you feel, wounded or damaged in some way. You are deeply upset at yourselves very often that there's something wrong with you and you should be able to fix it. When we're doing sadhana, spiritual practice, every day, like most of you are, things unwind. But the ultimate result of doing practice in a, in a concerted and consistent way is not that you will become psychologically repaired. First of all, your whole relationship to time and personality will change. And that story of you that you inherited from a little bearded guy in Vienna mm -hmm. <laughs> in the latter part of the 19th century will no longer make much sense to you. The idea that you are damaged will no longer make much sense to you. If you are starting to feel more like Things have happened and there are karmas, but you are undamaged by them. They are just things that are manifesting. Then you're getting somewhere. But if you're still feeling how terrible about me, how terrible I am, how terrible it is that I have these samskaras, you are still being a poster child for the psychological worldview and a victim, I would say. If anything, that if you've been damaged by anything, it's that. When I have spent time with families from China or Tibet or India, no one sits around and moans uh, or complains about their, their inner problems. They don't not have them. They don't not think that they, they, you know, they have the same feelings we have. But they don't talk about them in the same way. They don't talk about them in other people in the same way either. There's much more space for people to just be themselves and uh, not be taken to task for having these problems that we think we have. But the, the real outcome of long-term consistent practice is not that you get to be a better you in that psychological way. That might happen along the way, of course, but the real result is knowledge of who you are, knowledge of who you really are, not that story from the late 19th century. That isn't who you really are. That is a historical blip. <sighs> so the outcome of real spiritual practice over a long time is that you get to know who you really are. And you get to understand to a much greater degree how reality actually works. I would love it if I asked the question of how your practice is going and someone said, well, I noticed something. I noticed something about how things really work. Or I noticed something about who I really am rather than I think my problems are getting better, or I think I'm seeing my problems more clearly. That's a much more common kind of an answer that I get, right? So tonight, I want to ask you, anybody, it doesn't have to be, there's people maybe here who have, haven't been practicing with me, but maybe you have your own practice, your own experience in, in spiritual stuff. I, but I'd like to ask anyone who would care to reflect, what have you learned about your real nature? What have you learned about how things work, how things are, as a result of whatever practice you have done?
sometimes I, I wonder if it's just my imagination, but, um, but I definitely feel like there's communication. Um, when I find myself, you know, thinking or doing certain things, even if it's just, you know, a sound out of nowhere or a bell that seems to ring from, you know, far away in the distance or something, a lot of times it really feels like, like there's actual communication. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, uh, it's exciting. Mm -hmm. Something like that, that you begin to experience and that you wonder, some part of you wonders if it's your imagination, that just keep, continues to deepen. You start to notice more and more of it. You start to be more and more sensitized to it. And you start to learn its vocabulary, which is not the same for everyone. And then no matter what, your Western mind, your ordinary mind, thinks about it, it doesn't matter because it won't go away. And this is something that I've talked about quite often. It's okay to doubt your spiritual experiences or things you think you've noticed about reality, which is all spiritual experiences are, are things that you're noticing about reality. That's really the definition of a spiritual experience. A spiritual experience is not, oh, I felt energy rising up my spine or I, I, I was trembling or I fell into some state or some experience. That is just a symptom of something. A spiritual experience is when you understand something, when you notice something, when your view enlarges, when you become transformed in some way, not just when you have some momentary physical experience. So when you have those kinds of upgrades to your view, <laughs> then they are tentative at first, right? But if you keep practicing, and, and, and you might have doubts about it, and it's good to doubt because you don't want to be in a state of fantasy, but then you have to start noticing that it really doesn't matter what doubts you throw at it. It's just still there. There's nothing you can really do about it. And eventually it just becomes your new reality. So that's how it goes. That's how it's always gone for me. I'm a champion doubter. So I've always lobbed doubts at everything that's happened to me. And the things that are real don't go away. And then, and then you know, Western mind just has to give up. Wave the white flag. <laughs> I think my experience has been around patience and timing and just letting wisdom through. That's what you call it. And not pushing so hard. What have you noticed about timing? That it exists on its own, and I try to manipulate it a lot. I try mm -hmm. to make things happen, and they tend to have bad results. Or less than stellar. <laughs> See, that's interesting. Learning about time is one of the major lessons of spiritual practice. I mean, that just continues on as you practice more. You learn more and more about time and timing. And pretty much happiness depends on good timing. Right? But we can have bad timing and get a result we're unhappy with or feel that we've been clumsy or something has we've missed an opportunity. That's common. But we can also have bad timing and not even notice it because we got something we wanted. Oh, that worked out, right? But we don't know what we didn't get if we had had better timing. This happens with divination. I do divination for quite a number of people and some percentage of people do not follow the advice of the divination. And sometimes it turns out obviously bad but other times it turns out fine from their perspective, but nobody knows what would have happened if they had actually followed the divination, right? <laughs> I think that's the other thing. I just don't know. Like, I can't predict what my actions will result into, whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. It might be good now, but it may turn bad later. Right. And vice versa. And why is that? Do you understand why? Because I don't, I can't see that much. 
Yeah, because there's a lot so of much. much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of much. You are like a speck in an infinite mandala. As we do practice, of course, we see more of the mandala, or we sense more of it as more like it. We can kind of sense time and sense energy, and then we become more adept at threading the needle. But nonetheless, no matter how adept we become, we're never going to be feeling the whole mandala. There's always something that is escaping our plans, overrunning you know, our view, our vision. And yeah, all you can do is act as skillfully as you're able to in that moment and phew, what it, come what may, right? That's a very important lesson. Time, learning about time just continues on and on and on. Yeah, the, the same thing, trying not to make it I've noticed, or, the, or, or you know, I've Well, you have. But, um, but no, you know, um, in the moment, you know, bad isn't always bad and good isn't always good. You mm-hmm. know, it's, it's more just, okay, this is all just sort of part of whatever is unfolding. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've definitely noticed, you know, that, that catastrophe generally isn't. <laughs> yeah. I went through a period when I started noticing how big that mandala of cause and effect was, when I just felt paralyzed. I just knew that I wasn't going to do the right thing, and I just got paralyzed <laughs> for a while. But then I got over myself. <laughs> so what I've noticed um, is how difficult it is not to want to tell a story about, oh, so why did this happen, or you did this and I did this. So let me explain why I did this back to you. Uh, and I had a circumstance recently where I tried not to do that and it was really hard to not kind of give in to, oh, here's my side of the story um, and just kind of let it go that whatever somebody thought uh, or didn't think was mm-hmm. okay and to feel ultimately more comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The more you wake up, the less you'll be able to explain your actions to other people anyway. (laughs) Somebody says, why did you do that? Why did you say that? Why didn't you do that? And it's it's almost impossible to explain. But what I experience more and more is it's it's such a miracle that we sit here right now in this body. And that happens more and more, that I feel like it's, it is almost, it's, it's funny. It's really, um, it's really difficult to explain. But probably from a shift of just silence, where I feel space, and, and then I come and, and I could just... Um, I don't, I don't know how to describe when I come back in this moment and realize that we can sit here and talk and just have bodies and, and, and I walk and I everything, this whole experience to be here. Is, um, new. Mm-hmm. Completely new. Yeah. yeah. And therefore it's, it's difficult to describe because as soon as I this experience that we're having is in these kinds of direct realization traditions it's called the glamour of reality the glamour of God in other words glamour has a lot of different meanings in English it means dressed up and beautiful and, and alluring it also means magical this is sometimes referred to as a magical display or uh, an ornament, that everything that's happening here. And that quality of it being jewel-like or a, a riot of sensory aesthetic experiences. 
uh, is throughout both the Indian direct realization traditions and those from Tibet. Okay. A real appreciation for the fact that all this is happening rather than nothing and how marvelous it actually is and how awe, awe-inspiring wonder, wonder it creates a sense of wonder. Um, something I've noticed is how, I don't know how to put it really, how close presence is. Like, at, like re- even recently, like, it felt really far away. Like, it was like this other thing, and it's just like right here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that, that really, like, reveals something about absence, which has been part of the fabric of my life and like concern for a long time. And just like like how textured absence is. Mm-hmm. And like sort of I don't know, like it feels like that's presence too. Mm-hmm. And there's there's this sort of like that's this too, that's this too, that's mm-hmm. this too ness. Everything. That experience of absence is being produced by presence. (laughs) It's another aesthetic experience. And in fact, you know, the Taoists have pretty much built their entire practice around that feeling. (laughs) You know, absence, nostalgia, longing, that's pretty much the flavor of traditional Taoist. Lineages, it's like their cultural flavor. And they've written massive amounts of poetry about it. Okay. Yeah. It's one way of experiencing presence, right? <laughs> Maybe you missed out. Maybe you should be a Taoist. <laughs> well, it's just amazing that there's so many ways to experience presence. Yeah. Through so many gateways, right? Like Ma said, we said so many different ways, but she said the ground that you fall on is what you'll put your hand on to help you to get up again. Anybody else notice anything about reality? Jayakula is a nonprofit community offering opportunities to learn and practice in the direct realization traditions of Trika Shaivism and Dzogchen. We are based in Portland, Maine and Portland, Oregon. Visit jayakula.org to explore more of our offerings.